What's going on, Coastal? How are you guys doing today? Come on. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is CJ. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad you're joining us. Can you guys help me welcome everybody that's watching online and everybody at our Lighthouse Point location? Come on. Let's give them a big round of applause. Man, we love you guys. We're so glad you're joining with us this weekend as we're starting a brand new series called Love Handles. And I know some of you guys thought that this was going to be a fitness series because some of us have some love handles. Really, this is a, a relationship series. And this is a series that is for everyone. We think whether, if you're married, this is a great series to be at church. If you're single, this is a perfect series for you to be at church. If you just went through a divorce, man, this is a great time to be at church. It's going to help you. If you're married and you want to get a divorce, it's really going to help you. I promise you. And so, uh, like, you're going to need this series. But we, we thought it'd be fun uh, to, to do something a little bit outside the box. So we did some breakup songs here today because I think breakups are a thing that we all deal with in life. There's some things that happen. And I want to start off today with some, some breakup notes that I found from kids online to each other. So check this out. This is Brock. Brock, why do you not talk to me? We have relationship problems. It starts young. Starts young. I don't want to get a divorce, but we might have to. I'm so sorry. Love, Paige. Paige has already learned how to do the breakup at an age where she can't even spell it. How about this one? From Delandra to Crystal. I'm breaking up with you. P.S. Happy anniversary, though, one month. It's really hard to do this. Delandra is a little confused on how this works. You don't celebrate anniversaries and break up at the same time. How about this one, right? Sean, I'm breaking up with you. You have not talked to me since the day you asked me out. How many know Sean's got some issues with his game? <laughs> he goes, that was three months ago. Three months ago. You need to get it together or you will never get married. And that would be sad. You should get married, just not to me, Rachel. <laughs> no love, no nothing, just straight up. See you later, Rachel. Like, there are no problems in life like relationship problems. Come on, somebody, don't you know that? Like, man, when you have relationship problems, it is just a difficult, difficult thing to go through. It got me thinking this week uh, about the first crush I ever had. Anybody remember their first crush? Like, it, it, like I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I started having a crush on this girl at 13 years old, and, and I was head over heels. I would write her love notes. I would do all this crazy stuff that, that no sane, normal person would do. And at 16 years old, it was December of 1994. That's how, this is how traumatic it was in my life. Uh, I finally asked this girl out on a date. And uh, she said, yes, I, I was excited. I remember driving over to her house picking her up. I had an incredible, incredible night plan. We started off at Chili's. Come on, somebody. Chili's in 1994 was high class, okay? It was like, it was like, it was like the Flemings of today, okay? It was, that was a big deal. Got some bottomless chips and, and salsa. Had a great time at dinner. Then we went to the world premiere of the greatest movie that was ever put on the big screen, Dumb and Dumber. We laughed, we cried, we, we had a great time. I took her home and I thought, man, that was a great first date. And then I called her the next day, Saturday, no answer. I left messages on the, the answering machine. We didn't have voicemail back then, we had answering machines. Left messages, no response. I, I call her Sunday, no answer. I page her. On Sunday with a 911. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. All you young people, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. We had these devices that we put in, and you'd put symbols on there to let them know it was important. Didn't get a call back. I, finally, I get a hold of her on Monday, and she proceeds to break up with me, but she broke up with me in a way that I had never experienced before. In fact, she used a phrase that maybe some of you have heard, but I, at this point in my life, I had not heard this phrase. She said, listen, TJ, we're breaking up, and it's not you, it's me. Anybody ever heard that before? It's not you, 
it's me. And when I heard that, I was like, you're right. It's not me. It is you. You are the problem. But then I came to realize that when somebody says, it's not you, it's me, what they really are saying that is, is that it's you. Like, you're the reason I'm breaking up with you because I can't stand you, you know? And so, and it got me thinking about this phrase, it's not you, it's me. And, and we use that a lot of times to break up with somebody, but I would like to submit to you today, church, that it's not you, it's me, could actually be the foundation of every healthy relationship if we apply it correctly to our lives. If we can learn to live with this idea that it's not you, it's me, it's not really your problem, it's actually my problem, and we take a little bit of ownership, we'll be able to see how to have healthy relationships God's way today. And so we're gonna look at this idea out of the first story in the Bible. If you want to grab your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 3, it's the, it's the first story. It's the story of creation. God creates Adam. He gives him a purpose. He gives him an identity. He's walking in the cool of the day with God and eventually says, man, it's not good for you to be alone. He brings Eve on the scene and we experience the great fall. And what I want you to see out of this story is the lack of responsibility that comes into this story. Starting in Genesis chapter three, starting in verse one, it says the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And listen, this is the number one attack that the enemy uses. He wants to get us to not trust God. He wants to get us to begin to question what God said. It's one of the reasons why we tell you to get in your Bible, get in your Bible, because you need to know what God said because the enemy is going to come and trying to bring some confusion to your life. It says, of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die. And listen, this sounds so much like our culture today. You can go ahead and do that. You can go ahead and do whatever you want. Listen, there'll be no consequences to your decision. Just go all right ahead. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be open. And this is what the world tells us over and over again. Listen, listen, when you do this, it's gonna be so much fun. Like you're, your eyes are gonna be open to all the fun that you could be having in life. It says, as soon as you eat it, you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and it looked good for fruit. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking among the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God called to man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Immediately the problem starts right here. Look at what he does. It was the woman, it was this girl right here that you gave me, God. It's her and it's you. Probably not a good start. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me. Uh oh, that's why I ate it. Skipping down to verse 13 or 16. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. And all the women were like, no. <laughs> and you will desire to control your husband and he will rule over you. And all the men said, don't say anything. That's a tr trick question. <laughs> That will cause a lot of problems in your relationship right there. It says, and to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife, that's another problem right there. Just kidding. <laughs> and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. The ground is cursed because of you. In all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. And here's what we see in our story. We see the man and the woman going back and forth, back and forth, blaming yeah. 
all kinds of things on their circumstances and on the turmoil that they are now experiencing in their relationship and in the relational world. And, and, and what happens in life is when we have a crisis or we have a difficulty, God a lot of times will come in and confront our issues. He'll confront our sin. And what we want to do a lot of times in those situations is we wanna do exactly like Adam and Eve did in this situation is they want to go and they want to point the fingers. It's got to be somebody else's fault. It's my mom's fault. It's those friends' fault. It's my third grade teacher's fault. It's my parents' fault. Or what we can do instead is we can take ownership of our problems and say, you know what? It's not them that's the problem. The problem is actually me. I'm the one that has the issue. I can't fix them, but I can fix fix me and I'm going to take ownership of the part that I have in this relationship. And here's why we have to do this. Because when we blame others, we get embittered in life. When we start to cast blame on other people, we're always mad because they didn't do this and they didn't say that and they didn't act the way that we thought that they were gonna act and we just end up getting angrier and angrier because they are not matching up to the expectations that we have set for them. But here's the second part. When we blame others, we get embittered, but when we accept responsibility, here's what happens. We get empowered. We get empowered in the relationship to actually see change in that relationship for it actually to grow and to thrive in our lives. The problem is, is that none of us want to accept responsibility because we think, well, if I accept responsibility that I'm going to feel bad. And the goal was today, TJ, that you were going to make them feel bad about what they're doing, not make me feel bad for my part that I'm not playing. And listen, God is not out there trying to make you feel bad. That's not his goal. His goal is, is for you to realize that accepting blame isn't about God faulting you. He's not trying to go, oh, look at how screwed up and messed up you are. Accepting the blame for yourself is about him actually freeing you in life. Because when we start to accept that and we start to realize that, we go, man, there's a freedom that comes from the recognition of it. And there's a joy that begins to happen in the relationship because you start going, it's not you that's the problem. It's actually me that's the problem. And so if we're going to begin to take ownership of things when it comes to our relational world, I'm going to give you three things here today, church, that I think that, that will really help you in this idea that it's not you, it's me. And here's the first one. You have to own the fact that you bring issues into your relationship. You've got to own the fact that you bring issues into the relationship. No other person is the sole source of the issues in the relationship. No, no, no. You bring something to that relationship. If you're in the dating world right now, there are questions that are good questions that you should ask when you're in that stage. There are questions like, like what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite meal? Are you a Christian? Good questions to ask, like what's the last Netflix series you binge watched? But there is another question that I think that you should put with your repertoire in that season, and it's this, what kind of crazy are you? Because we're all crazy. It's just what kind of crazy? Are you, are you just normal crazy or are you keep my car crazy? Are you normal crazy or are you stalk me and download everything on my phone to see everything I've ever done kind of crazy? Are, are, are you just crazy crazy or are you like crazy crazy crazy? And I think we just have to know up front so that we know what we're dealing with in the relationship. And I know some of you are thinking right now, I wish I would have asked that question. It would have saved me a lot of problems that I've dealt with over the last 50 years, you know, but... Here's why we have to ask that, because Romans 3, 23 tells us, for all of us have sinned, we all have crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And we all fall short of God's glorious standards. And in other words, we all, we all have issues. We all have struggles. And, and we all, what we do is we take all of those things that are our issues and our struggle and our past, and they're our baggage, 
that we bring into every single relationship. And a lot of times, we don't even recognize that we have it. And so what happens is, is when there's a conflict in the relationship, you immediately think it's them, but the reality is, is your reaction is based on your upbringing. It's based on how your parents interacted with one another in their relational dynamics that now you're bringing those dynamics into this relationship. It really has nothing to do with them and it has everything to do with you. It's not you, it's actually me. And here's why this is so important for us to recognize because getting honest is always the first step in us actually getting healthy. And the goal for every relationship is that we would be healthy in the relationship. And so we have to be honest about what baggage am I bringing into this relationship? So if you ask your significant other, like, what's your baggage? And they say nothing, they're living in la-la land. Like, they're not living in reality because the reality is, is we're all walking in with something. Do you know what that stuff is? And once you know what that is, you have to recognize that your past is not your past if it's still impacting your present. And so you might have to unpack that some more and start to realize that it's not really you that's the problem. It's actually me that's the problem because I have not dealt with these things. And now I'm bringing them in and it's creating and causing conflict with something that you have nothing to do with. Number two, is you have to stop trying to find the right one and instead become the right one. Because it's not you, it's me. And here's the thing that I know. I can't change anybody, but I can change me. I can't change Shayla, I've tried, it doesn't work. (laughs) Just like you can't change your spouse, but you can change you. And it seems like today, we're in this crazy, crazy world where everybody is looking for the quote unquote, the one. The, 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 my better half, the, the one that is going to complete me. And I just want you to know, there is no person that is going to complete you. There's not a perfect person out there that is going to complete you. The goal for you is not to search for the one. The goal for you is for you to fight to become the one in life. Yeah. There you go. See, I... Because we, we, we all, I, I don't know why this is, we all have the, the idea that if I find the right one, they will complete me. And, and, and we, we believe this because we believe Jerry Maguire. We believe, we believe today's culture, right? There, there he is, right? Because we all remember the scene from Jerry Maguire where he, he busts into the room full of the ladies that are, are just terrible. And he goes, we're in a cynical, cynical world. And he looks at Renee Zellweger and he goes, but I love you. And you, come on church, you, come on my my Jerry Maguire people. (laughs) And then Renee looks at him with a confused face and says, shut up. And Jerry is like, what? He's he's confused himself. (laughs) She goes, shut up. You had me at, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Lighthouse Point, I hope you got that. That's great for movies, but that's not reality. You tell me to shut up, it's gonna be, it's not gonna go good. I'm gonna guess it's probably not gonna go good in your relationship either. Here's the deal. There is not a person out there that will complete you. There is not a person that has that ability to complete you. Because in Christ, you are called to be complete and whole in him and him alone. So no person is gonna be able to come in and fill the God void in your life. And part of the issue that you're having in your relationships is you're expecting that person to be your God when you're supposed to have a relationship with the Lord your God yourself. 
being complete and in totality in who he has called you to be. But TJ, doesn't it say it's not good for me to be alone? Like, like, like what's, the, what's the deal? Like, I'm single right now and I'm struggling. Yes, look, look at what the Bible says. And actually in Genesis, right where we're, it says the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. But being, understand that being alone and being single are very, very different. Because we have this stigma in our world where we go, oh, I'm all alone. And listen, you can be in a relationship and be all alone. I watch people go from relationship to relationship to relationship thinking, well, I can't be alone. I can't be alone. And they don't understand that wasn't what God was talking about at all. He's not saying don't be single. See, this word alone is this idea of isolation. He's, he's saying, don't be isolated in life. Like, it was about being disconnected from community. It was about being disconnected from friends. It was about being disconnected from having the right family. Let's, let's fight against being disconnected in life. Like, don't be alone. It's not good for a man to, to be alone. Doesn't mean that you, you don't have significance until you're with other people. It means you need to find your significance in God and have other people around you to support that. Because singleness is actually an identity. It's an identity thing. And there's a huge difference between alone and isolation and your singleness and your identity. And listen, it's good to be single at times. Because it's in that time you discover, who am I in Christ by myself? Who has God called me to be? What is my purpose? What is my destiny? What is my identity in him? And, and we live in a culture where we think, well, well, if we have two broken parts and we put them together, it'll make something whole. Two broken things don't make a whole thing. They make a multiplication of brokenness in our life. It's never what God wanted for our lives. Before Adam ever needed Eve, he was whole and in him of himself, living with purpose, counting the animals, walking in a relationship with God. He had his purpose. And a lot of you guys are looking for a person. And instead of looking for a person, you should be looking for your purpose. I'm preaching way better than you're responding. I'm just letting you know that. Like you gotta make it about who has God called me to be? What has he called me to do? And if you'll run after Jesus, here's what will happen, single person. You'll be running so fast after Jesus, you'll look to your left or you'll look to your right, and you'll see somebody running next to you, and you'll go, hey, how you do it? And that's how it works right there. And some of you guys, you're despising the single season, and this is a season that God has you in, so he can get you to be all that he's called you to be, so he can create in you who he's called you to be. And, and you, got, you just gotta, you gotta embrace that, because when Adam embraces, look at what happens in that verse 18. He says, I will make a helper who is just right for you. Notice he didn't bring Eve in to complete him. He brought Eve into his life to be a helper. Like, he was just continuing doing what he was already doing. It didn't change his destiny, it actually enhanced his destiny. That's what marriage does. Marriage always magnifies what you already have in your life. See, I was happy before Shayla ever came into my life, but when Shayla came into my life, I became happier. I was brave before Shayla ever came into my life, but when Shayla came into my life, I became braver. I was funny before Shayla ever came into my life. But after Shayla came into my life, I became funnier. Come on, somebody. None of y'all are agreeing with me. I guess that isn't true. Here's what it is, and I need you to get this because it's so significant. The er is the suffix. It's the last part. And the first part is actually called the root. This is sentence development 101 right here. So here's what you're looking for a lot of times in a relationship is you're looking for the root to be that person. And as much as I love my wife and I love her with all of my heart, she is not my root. My, I am rooted in Christ Jesus 
my Lord and Savior. I have my identity in Christ. And she just comes in and she compliments the identity that I already have in him. He is my root and she is my earth. And a lot of you guys, you're looking for your root in him or in her. And, and I want you to know that is a bad root to build your life on. Make your root in him and watch how it will magnify everything you already have. Which, by the way, if you don't deal with the brokenness that's in your life, if you're broke before marriage, when you get married, you'll just be broker. Yeah. Yeah. If you're chunky before marriage, come on, help me out. You'll just be chunkier. Just trying to help some people out here. Number three, do your part to build the relationship God's way instead of culture's way. This is so important and we, we talk about this all the time because the world has gone overboard on telling us how relationships should work and the way that they're giving us to do relationships, I'm just telling you, church is flat out wrong. So I wanna help you as we close out this message because the Bible says it like this. There's a way that appears to be right. And the world says, this is how you should do it. This is how love looks. This is how love acts. This is how love feels. But here's what the Bible says. But in the end, it leads to death. It leads to death. So, so here's what the world says relationships should look like, and I, I got some props here, and so what they say is, 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 is right here, I have a, a little smiley face. This is gonna represent physical, because this, this is where most relationships start. It starts from a physical aspect. Oh, look at him, look at her. Ooh, did you see the biceps on him? Did you see the six pack? Ooh, look at her curves. And the reason we look at the physical It's because we don't know how to have healthy relationships. And, and when you don't know who you are in Christ, what you do is you make it about something that you can actually control in your life. And because you don't know who you are in Christ, you have nothing to offer the other person besides the physical. And so what happens is it, is it starts right here and we, we build it on this aspect and, and then we go, oh, then what happens is, it, is the relationship becomes emotional. It's about all the feels. It's like, oh, they make me feel so, oh, they're, oh the, the, the heart palpitations. It's where at night you go, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. What are you doing? nothing just listening to you breathe <laughs> for hours and here's what I know is if you feel your way into a relationship you'll feel your way right out of it it's why we say things in our culture today like I love you but I'm not in love with you anymore what's happened you've lost the loving feeling Congratulations, welcome to adulthood. What you're discovering is, is that love is not a feeling, love is actually a choice. Love is actually a decision that you make on a daily basis and if you'll start making the right decisions, you'll start having the right feelings again. But what, what we do is we start to make this our foundation and then we go, oh my gosh, they're, they're, oh, they feel so good. Oh, I'm going to introduce them to all of my friends and family. And we start bringing them around and your girlfriend's like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. Does he have a brother? <laughs> and then you'll start hearing things like, oh, they're the one, they're the one. And then three years later, when you get divorced from them, that same friend will be like, I knew he was no good. Great friends right there you got. But what we do is, is, is we start to stack that up on there. And, and this is the point where a lot of people get married at because now that I've introduced them to my friends and my family, now, now, now we're all in. And so, so then what we do is, is we get married and all of a sudden we start living together and we start realizing, I don't know who this person is that I just married. Like, like, and then you start asking yourself questions like, 
what did I do? Because I didn't find out anything actually about them. And all of a sudden, this relationship is, 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 is getting a little rocky, and we think to ourselves, well, the, the only thing I know how to do right now is, is the best thing that I know how to do is I'm going to throw some Jesus on there and hope, hope that Jesus solves this all. And maybe if I go to church and, and, and I sing a song, then, then it'll fix everything in my relationship. And, and what, you seem to, what you find is that it becomes very unstable at this point because Jesus was never meant to be the pinnacle of your relationship. He was always meant to be the foundation on which you built your relationship. And so you think this will be the solve. I'll just throw Jesus on it and hope that that happens. But whether that's a month or a year or five years from now, the weight of the Christhood has in your life will crush your relationship. Because it was never meant to be on top. It was meant to be the foundation. And can I submit to you today? That it's not you. It's me. That we have to begin to take ownership of our relationship no matter how it was built and what it looks like. Because for some of us, our relationships are collapsing and our relationships are falling apart and our relationships are teetering right now. And you have to take ownership in this moment because if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's gonna be in your relationship, it's gonna be up to you to do something. So I want you to know that if your relational world looks like this, whether it's your friendships, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your life, and you wanna, you wanna build this the right way, what you have to do is you have to, you have to start with the foundation. You have to start with the spiritual right here and you have, to, you have to go, you know what, I'm gonna build my life upon Christ the rock, I'm gonna find my identity, I'm gonna find my purpose, I'm gonna find my worth, I'm gonna find my value right here, I'm gonna get in God's word, I'm gonna spend time in prayer, I'm gonna make this the foundation of everything that I do. And this is so critical because what you have to understand is when you make this the foundation of everything that you do, the problem with this is that there's only room for this for one person in this relationship. When it's all about the physical, it's about when you meet my needs, when you do what for me, what I need, then this relationship works. But the moment you don't look good, the moment you don't satisfy me, there's no room for you here anymore. And I'll just move on and find somebody else. But when I build my life on the rock, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, there's room for my spouse. There's room for my children because there's room because the foundation is solid enough for it. And then as, as you start to build right there, what you do is you, you begin to get social and you go and you get into a connect group. You start to serve on a dream team. You start to build some friendships with some people and watch as, as how you do that. All of a sudden, you start to move into interpersonal. You, you're going to church and you realize that as you're in that group, you're in a worship service and you see somebody raise their hand and there's no ring on the finger. You go, that's an option. That's my future boo right there. And you start to get to know them, who they are, what their life is built on. And, and it's in this stage that we take to heart what the Bible says, guard your heart above all else. So we're guarding our heart as we're getting to know some people right here. And as we, we start to see that relationship blossom, what we do is it, it becomes, starts to become a little emotional. We start to, to feel some things. We start to realize that, man, I, I, my heart is starting to move towards this person. And I'm still going to guard it, but I'm, I'm going to make sure that this is the way that God wants me to build. And this is the perfect time for people to get married right here. See, there is a purpose and a plan that God has. Don't skip the process and jump right to the physical just because it's starting to get emotional. No, no, no. You do things the right way because when you do things the right way, God's blessing is on your life. So you get married and then you get to add in, let's get physical, physical. This is my favorite part after Jesus of the marriage. Right here. 
said every man. <laughs> and when you do it like this, everything changes. So many of us are focused, well, TJ, what, what if this isn't great? No, 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 don't worry about it if this is gonna be great. You focus on you being great. Like you focus on, on being great in your relationship with God and I promise you, the healthier this is, the better this will be. Yeah. And maybe you're sitting out there and you're going, but TJ, mine's, mine's already jacked up in a mess. It looks nothing like that. Like I don't, I don't even know how to, it's, like, TJ, it is so screwed up. I don't even know how that is possible. And I have good news for you today. God provides a way if you'll start building the foundation. And it could take you 20 minutes or it could take you 20 years. But if you'll start building the foundation, this is what 2 Corinthians says. It says, my grace, it's God speaking, my grace is all you need. My power works best when in my weakness. So I'm gonna boast about my weakness. It's not you, it's me. So that the power of Christ can begin to work through me and through this relationship. And if you're out there and you feel like, man, I can't build it the right way, his grace is sufficient for you today. When you put it on God, he'll build it in the social and the interpersonal and the emotional and the physical. Let's build it on him. You build you and let God build the relationship. You bring it to God. You bring it to God, church. And here's God's solution. It's not you, it's me. Let's build it the right way and watch God do what only he can do in your relational world. Would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? God, we thank you that you're a God that meets us right where we are. It doesn't matter how beautiful it looks or how messy it is. God, you love us enough that you met us right in the middle of our mess. And I pray right now for every messy marriage, God, that you can turn into a masterpiece right now. God, I pray that we would take the responsibility, that we'd realize that it's not everybody else's fault, that it, if it's to be, it's up to me. It's not you, it's me. And God, we'll start to take responsibility for the issues that we're having, for the problems that we're having, for the baggage that we're bringing in. And God, I pray that as we do that, as we start to lay the foundation on the firm and solid rock on which we can stand in Jesus Christ, that, that as we focus on being the best us that you've called us to be, that God, you would step in and your grace would be sufficient. Your power would be made perfect in our weakness and you would do what only you can do as we do what only we can do is take the responsibility and trust you. God, I thank you for restoration that's gonna take place. I thank you for conversations that are gonna take place here today between families and couples and how you're gonna to begin to do something new and fresh in our lives. But God, I also know that maybe there's some people that are out there that they look at their life and their life is pretty messed up and I want you to know that God had a solution for your mess. It was his son Jesus that he sent 2,000 years ago. He said, I realize that that mess is pretty big but I've got a solution that can clean it up and it's the it was on the cross of Calvary that Jesus paid the price for your mess. And maybe you're out there today, and I'm not talking about rules or religion, I'm talking about a relationship with God. Maybe you need to have a relationship with God for the first time or the first time in a long time. Where you go, God, it, 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 it's not you that's the problem, it's me and I'm in need of a savior who can change my circumstances and change my situation. If that's you on the count of three, if you just slip your hand up, I'd love to pray a simple yet significant prayer with you, one, two, Three, yes, ma'am, I see you, thank you. Yes, back there, three. Anybody else? Don't miss your moment. Yes, I see you back there, four, thank you. Anybody else? If you'll pray this prayer in your heart, Lighthouse Point, as we pray it here, say, God, thank you for loving me, and thank you for meeting me right in the middle of my mess. Thank you for giving a solution through your son, Jesus, who came and died for my sins and for my past. I ask you to forgive me of my past, change my present and secure my future. God, I love you and I thank you for the new beginnings that I'm having here today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.